Uy, mahalo everyone for joining us this evening. Super excited to be here. I just going to um, open the space for all of us and then we'll begin. Mahalo nui. Hello, my pakahi apau. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Kamuala Inos, and I am the director of the Office of Indigenous Innovation for the University of Hawaii System. I was really glad to be here. Um, tonight, our conversation is going to be really robust, but before we do that, I really want to mahalo everyone that's invested in this project. University of Hawaii Manoa Seeds Ideas the Biocultural Initiative of the Pacific and Sea Grant, uh, Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. So mahalo nui to all those organizations, institutions that are invested in authentic Maoli-based learning. Um, <clears throat> this is a continuation of the ongoing Sciences and the Sacred Speaker Series, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Focus. The intention of this series is to center conversations with indigenous practitioners from continental and oceanic spaces in a knowledge sharing exchange and to create dialogue between Kanaka Uivi and allies, Kanaka Uivi allies and other indigenous communities to lay the groundwork for collaborative partnerships within Hawaii that are grounded in indigenous data sovereignty principles. Use conversations to advance Kanaka Uivi native find efforts towards data sovereignty. So mahalo for all of us showing up in that space. <clears throat> Tonight's topic will be really cool, if I may say so myself, because it's about how we engage creatives, indigenous creatives and innovations from a Maoli lens. That's really kind of the core thing we're talking about tonight. Um, and we have a really distinguished panel, <laughs> if I may say so myself too. Um, we have Kuha Ozain, uh, as you can read along with me. Kuha O is, let me get it out, the creative director of Sig Zane Designs and SZ Kayao Student Studio and the president of the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation. He also serves as a board member for PVS Hawaii and marketing director for Moku Ekeave Foundation. Uh, Kuhao was born and raised in Hilo and is the sixth generation in his family to practice hula. Next, we have with us this evening Keola Raposo. He's the creative director of Fitted, FADS, Market Ready, and Trop Tech. He, the aim of Fitted's mission is to teach the youth, the importance of embracing culture and history while maintaining a high standard on quality, functionality, and aesthetics. Kiola graduated from HCC's fashion design program and worked as a designer at Tory Richards prior to co-founding Fitted. Aloha e Kiola. And then finally, we have Kari Kehau Noi. Kari Noi is a PhD assist, a research assistant at the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications, LAVA, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and co-leads the Emerging Media Lab CreateX at the Academy of Creative Media at the University of Hawaii at West Oahu. She is interested in the ways emerging media can support learning. As a mixed Kanako Uivi Native Hawaiian scholar, she focuses on the projects that involve Hawaiian cultural heritage. Her work has been featured in local and international conferences and venues, including the Bishop Museum on Oahu and the Global Asia Pacific Art Exchange, GAX. 
in Montreal. So mahalo nui kako um, for all of you coming up tonight. <clears throat> the important part of all of this work, and I'll have the speakers jump on in a moment, just to ground it, was really critical, um, I think, for me as a, the areas that excited me when Dr. Allegato um, asked if I could curate this conversation among creatives is what does it really mean to build a field? Uh, each of these speakers tonight are working at the intersect of bringing their heritage as Kanaka Maoli into the space of design and reflecting that in a way that kind of helps continue this practice of art, like the continuity of, of our traditions and practices, but in this really important way of like taking a product to market and being able to create jobs and industries out of our practices. And I think that to me is a really needed conversation because there's a lot of spaces around how you do these things in the space of research. But for our people, economic sovereignty is vital. And we need to figure out like, how do we stand in these spaces, um, bring our ancestry with us, but do so in a way that we can begin to develop processes or means to have industries be raised around it. And I think there's a lot of complexity in that because there's a lot of lines between what things do we hold sacred? What things do we share? What are the means and mechanisms by which we generate revenue? And also maintain the pono of our identity. And I think those are conversations that I ask them all to think about and to reflect in their practice. But at the end of the day, what is the most important thing out of all of this is that these conversations are necessary. Um, the time we're living in now really compels us um, to lean into the fact that we have a whole cadre of Kanaka, Uivi, and uh, Kama'ina allies that are now cultivating fluencies in their ancestral practices and frameworks, but also contemporary structures that we need to be forging into these uncomfortable conversations because otherwise, if you're not on a, a great mentor of mine told me, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So how do we make sure that we're at the table and we're not the menu and that we can eventually grab that table. Thank everybody for joining us for dinner and dragging that effing thing into our communities and setting up shop there. And I think that was really like how our kupuna love to do things. They love to, to me, the sign of what it meant to be Kanaka Oivi in Hawaii and the sign of what it meant to, you know, be an exemplary person it was agency that we had provided choice and control to ourselves and we could make decisions in the face of oppositions and have hard conversations, but ultimately reflect on the pono of our work in that people are fed, that our landscape is abundant. And those are the types of conversations I'm really excited to have now. So the speakers will be along an arc. I'm thinking a lot about Uncle Kekuni Blaisdell and his conversation about Pico, the portals of um, to connecting to our ancestors. I learned in my corpus of practice, Mao, like the Pico Po'o, your Pico O, as we learned that Mao is the connection to your kupuna, the connection to Akua, the things that came before you. The Pico Vaina or your navel, your Pico E, as we kind of learned in our space, was the connection to the people in the Ao. What is the things, the time of Ao and those living with you? And then the Pico A or Pico Ma'i, your reproductive organs, was your connection to the futures. So we've lined our speakers along this arc. We ask Kuhao to, given his, if you don't know who the Kanako Foundation is at this point, you're probably in the wrong seminar. But given the role that EKF has played for all of us and the, the Kanako, Kanako Oleohana in providing us the, the touch points to our ancestry, we asked him to go first to talk about the lineage he brings with him and how it shows up in his work now. And then I've asked Keola Raposo a, friend, a dear friend for many years, uh, I'm a Wai'anae boy, he's a Ka'alu boy, that are in interesting spaces. How he, like, his entry point into this space is really E, it's the oh, it's the now, true streetwear and other things that he grew into and in bringing his culture with him into this really interesting space and then the emergent um, design. 
and then and the people are because everyone knows the future is what he meant. We asked Kari to we're all Kari's opening app to share with us about what she sees and the emerging work that she's working in and to talk about what the future of this could be. So I really appreciate everyone being here tonight for this conversation. And I want to step back and ask Kehao, Ku Hao, <laughs> sorry, long day, Ku Hao, uh, to open the space for us with this sharing. So, Mahalo Nu E Ku Hao. Mahalo Kamu. Definitely, definitely a long day uh, with multiple Zooms, <laughs> multiple Zooms with you, but uh, definitely appreciate this opportunity and uh, humbled to be a part of this hui and humbled to be able to share a little bit of some of my family's lineage as well as some of the work that. Uh, my dad has done, and also the work that I do currently. So, um, mahalo nui and aloha to everybody that has joined onto this um, Zoom space. I'm just about to share screen and then we'll kind of get started. Um, okay, just double checking. Everybody should be able to see the shared screen now. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of start off the whole, start off the whole thing, you know. Obviously, um, uh, as far as my family is concerned, from Edith Kanakole down. So just kind of starting off with the lineage of things and how it kind of informs my day-to-day -day work. So generally, um, everything kind of starts at the Luapele, at Hale Ma'u Ma'u, and for for me. It starts with uh, my grandma, who is Edith Kikuhi Kuhi Puon on Aliki Okohala. And of course, she, is, she was an icon of her time and definitely an important and integral per, part of the revival of the Hawaiian language, as well as a cultural icon as, and hula icon. Um, at the same time, she was a Kuhi Kuhi, which is the person that directs or the person that pushes, the per person that sets angles and that Kuhi Kuhi Puone is somebody that knows these uh, cycles of a space to be able to create predictability for survival. And so in her position of being that Kuhi Kuhi Puone, she was really concerned about the survival of language, about the survival of hula and the survival of the culture. And so she was definitely one of the icons of the Hawaiian Renaissance of that 70s. Uh, to, her, um, to her right uh, is Auntie Pua, who, um, you know, in her own right, is a queen of this current day right now. Uh, she was just yelling at me at an interview I was doing with her earlier. So for sure, she's um, a queen currently. And then also on her left is uh, my mom, Nalani Kanakaole. And to me, my mom brings each of these different, um, different fields of interest and weaves them all together so seamlessly. And it all is very um, prevalent within her work as a choreographer, as a uh, Kumuhula of Halao Kekuhi, as well as an artist, a sculpture, and just an overall renaissance tita that I like to call her. So overall, these are the pillars of, um, of my family, of my ohana, um, ohana Kanakaole. And a lot of it that we like to pull from it is this ancestral wisdom and research. I know I said earlier that a lot of our, our um, hula practice is based within our sixth generation. I'm the sixth generation. And there's actually two generations after me. So within our eight generation um, family practice of hula. And I, ha I had to like really think about that for a little while. And it made me realize after um, thinking about this involvement of choreography of hula. So when you have to do choreography of hula, you're constantly looking at the same mele, at the same oli, at the same ka'au to be able to understand all the intricacies within the definitions of maybe just one word. And you have to understand the, def the definition so that you can turn that into choreography at a certain point. So over my mom's now about 60 year uh, hula career, she's probably looked at the same Oli, maybe, you know, a thousand times. And every time she looks at it, she comes up with this new definition. And so she's able to implement her new experiences as well as her new interests and constantly have this drive to be able to be creative, but at the same time, still grounded within this ancestral text, this ancestral wisdom. And so that's where we pull a lot of our inspiration from. 
and that's how we move it into current day. Um, now I'd like to talk about this little pocket guy in the middle over here. He's he's from uh, pretty close to where um, uh, Ola is from, right around the corner, Kaneohe. But um, this guy, Sigzin over here, he was someone that was very inspired by the culture. And quite honestly, he came to Hawaii Island for more economic means. But while he was going to college, he kind of had a, a, a change of interest at the moment because of the fact that he ran into Edith and Edith convinced him, my grandma Edith, convinced him to come and join the Halal. And while he was at the Halal, he was learning not only the choreography of hula, but he was learning all of these associated arts around hula, no matter if it's creating these lay of kinolau and understanding where these kinolau grow, or if it's creating the a'ahu with ohe kapala, with kapa, or even creating the implements that go along with hula. And I think one of the biggest things that he learned while he was uh, dancing hula is that each of these kinolau that are important to these ancestral texts, as well as important to our hula altar, each of these kinolau grow at different elevations. And some of the areas that he was looking at, maybe more from an economic value, now had a current, now to, had a total change of value for him. And he understood it more for the understanding of its environmental value to that space. And so that's where he had a change of heart and he ended up changing his career and trying to rethink how he can educate people beyond just uh, vocal means, how he can educate people about these native plants, about these native penal law. Um, beyond that, I think it's important to also have a continual cultural practice. So no matter what your cultural practice is, if it's um, to be a Levaita or if it's to be to do He'enalu or if it's to be a hula aiha'a, whatever your cultural practice is, to make a lay, to weave. Uh, I think that that continual cultural practice is a place to continually harvest insight that can feed your day-to-day -day career. So with that continual cultural practice, um, one of the early things that my, my dad is probably not gonna like me sharing this picture, but anyway, he's not on here. Um, but the idea of that show of hand and that idea of having that integral hand work being put into your art, that was something he believed a lot in and that's something that still continues today. And so from Sigtain Design, starting off literally from pareos as little gifts of love, if I may, to my to my mom at the time. I'm, I'm still kind of, it's still weird for me to say that, sorry. Uh, but from the pareos that were gifts at the time, all the way through to today, all of that artwork still are, still are fruits of his hand. And so when you're looking at the artwork that we have on our Aloha shirts, or if it's any of the projects that we have today, everything originates from this hand cut ruby lip, which is uh, exacto. And it's um, a red film with a clear film underneath it and lightly cut into it. And when peeled away, your, your art is revealed. Um, but other than that, nothing much has changed. It's pretty much stayed the same from 1985 all the way through to now. I, I officially joined the payroll part of the company because my dad's pocket and I was pretty much working. I saw he made short tables so that I could fold a lot earlier. But um, that said, uh, not much has changed. And I've been officially on payroll from uh, about 2002. And so I'm about to make 20 years with this company, which is kind of crazy to think about. But um, beyond that, all we like to do is just uphold some of those same important things. Uphold the ruby lift, uphold that show of hand, uphold the ancestral texts, uphold the research, and how do we actually weave in some of these cultural perspectives, weave in these practitioners' perspectives even more. And so that's where we start to think about Papuku Makavalu, which is a methodology that was coined or brought to life by Antipua, or I should say Dr. Puolani Kanakuala Kanahele, and it's that concept of viewing these ancestral texts with eight eyes and understanding that within every word, within every olelo no eao, there are multiple different meanings within there. And to be able to define each of these meanings or take different perspectives into account. And so this practice of Papuku Makabalu um, was brought to life, I wanna say around 2009. And when I was watching this, I realized how much these multiple definitions and this process can actually help me within my design process. And so 
we actually adopted this whole idea of Makabalu into our overall design process. And that has led to a bunch of different um, epiphanies, uh, both I feel like ancestral epiphanies as well as design epiphanies. So I got to thank Antipo for introducing us to Papuku Makabalu. And then besides that, our product has not changed. This has been the same Aloha shirt that I told my dad I didn't want to wear in my senior pictures. And I'm probably going to get paid back for that later on in life. But besides that, our Aloha shirt has not changed. It's the same Aloha shirt that we have today that is still available either in our Hilo store or our store in Chinatown. And the one main thing that hasn't changed is the narrative that is embedded within each of our Aloha shares. And that's the important thing is that the visual is actually just a vehicle. The Aloha shirt is actually just a vehicle for the cultural narratives, for the cultural values, and for the storylines that are embedded within them. And that is where it kind of takes me now to SC Kyao, SC Kyao Studio, which is our design studio currently where I'm sitting right now. And it made me realize that which, with each of these Aloha shirts, there is always a story or narrative that gets passed on. And hopefully, if somebody is interested in them or curious about them, then we can share that with them. But in my mind, as I'm going to design school and coming back, coming back home, I realized, why do we stop at the Aloha shirt? How do we take it as far as we can? How do we share this narrative with as large of an audience as possible? And so that kind of led us on this whole journey of different projects this um, this overall Zoom is not really about my past projects, more about future projects. So I'm just going to click through this section really quickly, really quickly, really quickly, really quickly, really quickly, really quickly. And overall, when it comes down to it, it's more about the idea of narratives and where it can be embedded. And for me, one of the things that always kind of popped up in my mind, this is our shop in Chinatown, is how do we embed these narratives into a space and into the visuals of a space? And so somebody asked me recently what those five points on the back of the wall meant. And when I was a little kid, I was a little insecure because I came from Hilo and I went to Oahu and all of my cousins in Oahu was calling me on country bumpkin and I was small country tripping out. And so when I actually opened my first store in Oahu, which is Sigon Smith, those five mountains is actually representative of the five mountains on my island here, Mokokiave. And this was my way of actually putting a flag in the middle of White Kahalulu. Um, but at the same time, being able to do the same thing that we did with all those shirts is embed story into these visuals. Um, and then at the same time, continuing that within each of the spaces that we do. And, you know, over the years, there's been multiple projects that have been enlightening for me. And also, like how Kamu said, which has kind of built economic value over time. And I definitely appreciate that he highlighted that because one of the projects that I wanted to talk about was actually in 2015, or I want to say this is actually 2014 or something, but the project with Ohana by Hawaiian. And this is one of our first times that we actually worked with some, a larger corporate entity. And while we we're working with them with this, this design, obviously as a design opportunity, it's monstrous and mind blowing to me to be able to even see artwork fly through the sky. I'm still kind of tripping out of that. But when it came down to the legalese of this, that's when I was realizing, oh, wait, I have a lot to learn because that's when they wanted to try and identify who was going to actually own each of these elements on this plane. And that's where it kind of set the question in my mind, like, oh, wow, when we're looking at this as artwork, who does own the triangle? Who owns the Hawaiian triangle? Who owns that Manu shape? Or who owns the Nuku shape? Or who owns the Kalo shape? And I realized that, like, you know, Kako should own it. Like, Alahui should own it. But at the same time, that kind of props the same question which we're asking today and hopefully can look at um, our fellow uh, speakers today to be able to answer what are the protections that are needed in our Hana Noeo. So all of that together, mahalo nui for the opportunity. I definitely appreciate and I'm humbled to be a part of it. Mahalo. Mahalo nui kua o, and mahalo nui in like the narratives that you brought up, really critical, uh, it's that idea of embedding, using like this, these themes of um, embedded in, in Sig Zane and in the Kanaka Ole Ohana were things that you bring with you, right? This done by hand, the, the continuity 
is that it's a practice. It's like a no ill. It's something you do and you get better at. And it's also a vessel and a way to tell stories. So each visual is not just a visual, but as you shared before, like images, it's a ka'o, it's a full-fledged story. And by using that kind of space that is created for your, by your father with the, the teachings and the practices and the kulan that you carry through your mother are kind of forwarding this idea of telling stories continually through the visual representation. But I, I appreciate that you landed, we can kind of touch on a later question and ask, answer session about what that means to protect it, but also what does it mean for these things to feed our people, to create jobs and to create opportunities that like, we're, um, we're, we're again pushing towards economic sovereignty. Mahalo nui. Next, I would like to ask um, my peer, Keola Raposo, um, if Kuha was speaking of the lineages and what we bring forward, I think Keola has really has done a wonderful work as long as I know him. The honor of meeting Kiola many years ago when I was back at Ma'o and <laughs> trying to figure out how do we hook up with people that can talk to make selling organic vegetables cool. And I was like, and luckily I bumped into all that. We've been like, partnering on stuff for a long time. And I just always appreciated, you know, how he was able to enter a crowded space like streetwear. And when I wore fitted stuff, I felt like, yeah, it was the streetwear closed but it was Kalaka. It was something that was reflecting my ancestry. And at that point we hadn't seen a lot of spaces where that was living. So I've always had a deep appreciation for like the boundaries he was working at. So Mahalo Nui e Ola, can you share a little bit of your mana o with us? Hello everybody. Um first thank you. I have to follow Kuhao. It's a big shoes to fill. <laughs> my fellow contemporary. I love everything that um his his Ohana and himself have have provided us um, a catalog of, of amazing work um, that we can all strive to to sit at that at that at that top of that that mauna. So thank you, Kual, for setting the setting the bar high. Um, mahalo to uh, Katie, Sarah, and yourself, Kamwela. Yeah, we've shared um, music over beers. Um, we we have many conversations and you enlightened me. And like always, if you need me on the wall, I will make sure that I show up with paint. So mahalo. Um, thank you everybody for your time. I uh, really appreciate this. I'm honored to be uh, a part of this conversation and any insight that I may um, be able to lend to this topic is, um, um, I'm humbled. Thank you very much. I'm not a pro at this kind of stuff. So um, I actually, really hate this kind of thing. So please bear with me as we walk through this, um, walk through this, this thing that I'm about to talk about. Uh, oh, it's working. Okay, so um, I guess we'll just start here. What makes creations and innovations Maoli? Um, this question for me is, is kind of like, there's so much here. Um, and I don't have the answer. I don't know if I'll ever have the answer. Um, I think for me, it's just showing up, working, um, trying to tap into that thing that stirs my soul and um, gives this thing, keeps the, keeps, the, keeps the boat going, keeps coal in the fire, um, and it keeps me inspired. So creating artwork and design is sort of that thing. Um, this is me, uh, Keola Nakaahiki Raposo. Um, I grew up partly in Ka'alaya, which I went to Waihole Elementary. Um, my dad was the um, groundskeeper. He used to cut grass while I was in while I was in um, while I was in the class. And at four years old, I'm sorry, at grade four, we moved to um, Kahalu side, Okana Road, um, in Ko'olau Poko. So this is sort of just my upbringing. I'm just a kid from Kahalu who um, grew up in a country, um, uh, Oahu country, <laughs> and uh, and I learned a lot um, about my culture, um, basically from our family business where we used to take, we used to make stuff, make mail, and take it to the craft fairs, and we were like Wao said, you know, free labor, you know, cleaning kamani nuts, sanding milo, making lomi sticks and stuff. So this. I'm a product of a craft fair. I'm a craft fair kid. 
my sister and I hate it. So you picture on it, right? Is my sister having to sell these things that we made all year long. Um, this is the ecosystem or the vessels we use to communicate art. Um, uh, so fitted is is sort of our our main stage. It's 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 kind of where we do have the economic driver. Um, Fads is our art and design studio where we're able to help other people communicate. Um, Make ready is sort of my my private um, opportunity to share thoughts and ideas that I have. Um, and Trop Tech is is sort of I get to tap into um, some of the studies that I had creating garments, patterns, um, um, articulating that sort of technical aspect of garment garment making when I was in college. And I have a real passion for, for clothing manufacturing and designing in general. So these are, these are, the, these are the vessels that we use to communicate uh, art and design. Um, so I'm just going to go through like some statements and kind of summary and offer some photos. And hopefully this sort of lands on on the topic at hand. So creating identity through diversity of design. Uh, design as a vehicle allows us to communicate ideas and concepts through modern techniques and applications. Garments, hats, shoes, space, digital, print, collateral, art installations. The intent is to reach the kid in Kahalu, growing up, learn, trying to learn himself, figuring out who he is, and the boardroom curious at the same point. Um, it's sort of broad and vast, but that's sort of who, who I'm trying to speak to when we're designing and trying to communicate. Um, again, I grew up on O'Connor Road. We had pigs at the bottom of my driveway. I fought, you know, we had chickens, we had, we had dogs, we had, um, I fished, my dad was a fisherman. Um, so, I, you know, that, that, that lifestyle is, is, is very, is very, you know, near and dear to me. But I also spent a lot of time listening to music. Um, you know, I, I grew up without social media. So I spent a lot of time um, trying to get my hand on magazines or, or buying pay-per-view to a beach street and whatever I could do to sort of connect with current pop culture is sort of where I found uh, inspiration or found things that really stirred my soul. So um, to communicate, this is sort of just a, a capsule that we did that speaks of that, where, you know, Jay-Z is a famous rapper. He's been an icon. Um, when I was growing up, he was he was he was Jazzle. He was Jazzle and Jay Z. They had a group, and he had this song called Hawaiian Sophie. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to sort of peer and extract those things um, and create new a new sort of way to present this um, uh, bootleg bootleg style of design and art. Um, so we created Hawaiian Sophie. Uh, and then we 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 take extract build and we mash it all together and this is we did a whole capsule collection from it so Hawaiian Sophie was able to live uh, more than just a title for a song in I believe it was ninety two I think is when it came out yeah ninety was in ninety two yeah um, this is another sort of communication um, this is a button down short sleeve um, sweat set. Um, that is, it, 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 it represents uh, a camouflage. It's a theme that we have throughout the existence of our brand. We're 17 years old now, um, coming up on 18. And um, I always thought it was interesting to play around with the iconography. Uh, I'm always into iconography and the island chain is iconography. Um, how can we create new iconography and uh we so these this camouflage is actually um three camouflages that we did it prior so we took the three and we mashed it together and this is called dpec which is a disruptive pattern island camel um, so you can't tell but there's triangles in here there's molokai moko kiave monokalaniko kakuyaba everything is in there so it holds this very um um uh, hawaiian centric ideas uh, and thoughts, but it's presented in a very modern and uh, streetwear way, like like Kamala says. Um, again, the iconography and imagery that you know we're in the middle of the ocean, and um, we do not live in grass shacks, right? Or uh, some people, I mean, it's it's kind of like that 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 thing that people say, "Well, you're from Hawaii," and I I worked in Waikiki for ten years, valeting cars. I heard it all, <clears throat> so. 
juxtaposition that imagery, um, Hawaiian IP, um, pop cultural IP, um, mash it all together and sort of what is the new communicative um, visuals that we can, we, can, we can extract from it and present. So again, he's holding an umbrella that is very centric in Hawaiian um, uh, sort of thinking. Um, we're talking about trade winds, um, our air condition, we're talking about proximity, and we're talking about uh, it, the, the most um, re remote landmass in, in the world. So these are sort of the ideas. And we're in Chinatown, you know, good, lovely old Chinatown that we all love. Um, so some of the narratives, small fish, big ocean, we must identify. So by weaving stories of ancestral br brilliance, we, with technology or modern culture, we can build narratives. So I just threw together a bunch of things that sort of pop in my head, Makala Sons, Led Zeppelin, Monao Company, Nas, Vladimir Osipov, Jay-Z, Clarence Lee, Bikinis, um, Locomotion, Banksy, Jean Charlot, you get the picture, Paella, Nike, Kanye West, Sig Zane, um, Toyotas, Pitbulls. These are all potential iconography that um, are all inspiration points that we, that we love to build narratives from. You know, Brother Walter with Virgil Abloh, I mean, it's like, I mean, you can have conversations for days. Gangstar, Kalakawa, um, Kakuiheva, Mano Kalanipo, NFL. I mean, there's just so much good stuff here. There's a plethora of inspiration, um, new, old, contemporary, futuristic. Um, our ancestors provided. So uh, we, I, I don't, I don't ever um, want to limit ourselves to certain topics or ideas, but because um, everything is there for us to sort of build designs from. So same thing here, like, you know, taking this sort of ancestral, um, where we come from, you know, I got uh, um, Kalani Moku there, I have um, Pia Pa, um, Po Paoli. I mean, these are all concepts and ideas that we've, you know, had the opportunity to read about, to research, to learn on, and recreate and offer a slant or uh, new creases on things. And um, um, this has been sort of our fair and our, our, our way of communication. How far can we push the design um, from something as simple as uh, the PL pop? Not simple, it's the, um, it's the door that unlocks everything, but, but just sort of those ideas create inspiration for us. And we present it in sort of this, this pop art culture, um, bright colors, uh, yeah, so idealistic design protocol. Um, so this is just something that I sort of pragmatically um, over the years needed to organize a, a, a way to create. So um, this sort of loose protocol that we, we kind of like abide by is the product space or service must be handsome. So if it sits on a shelf, like it has to look good. So somebody, for somebody to come in and buy it because you know, we, we are a destiny, a destination location, but people do come by and may not know who we are. So we have to have product for them. Um, second one is surface level rationale of handsome. There's a reason, it has to be a reason why uh, it's handsome, well, color, fabric, construction, etc. cetera. Um, the narrative should have context that post questions of discovery. So if you bought something because you liked it by the color of fabric, you went home and you discovered something sort of gives it a level of kauna, like, oh, that's super cool, that little embroidery or that little caption or, you know, this narrative that, that I, I now discover, you know, three, four days after I buy it. And then a nod to um, Antipua, as, as um, uh, Kuhao was saying, uh, having multiple levels of storyline creates distinguishing connections. So it's like that Makovalu. Um, just to talk about that also, it's, it's sort of a guiding light, you know, there's eight ways to set your path, um, set your boat, right? When you're starting your life, when you're moving out of your house, you can go north, west, east, you can go northeast, northwest. So there's eight directions in life you can choose your path, um, choose wisely, you know, the sort of that level of, um, of, uh, of thinking we love to, we love to make sure that it's covered. Um, so something similar like this, where we did a, we did a collection. Um, I'm a, I'm a big Kakui have a fan. Um, um, 30 years of, 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 of benevolence, you know, benevolence is just 
food, happiness, no warring, um, O'ahu King, um, uh, born at Kukani Loco, many beautiful things to speak of on, on, on this chief. So I, we created a collection when we turned 10 and I wanted to sort of preserve that or, or have a conversation about this, this, this place that these kings come from and Kukani Loco and, um, and we presented it on Manawahine uh, in, in, in our ancestral element, holding our ancestor um, in this very modern uh, flannel, baseball flannel. There's a lot of con context to this, to these shots. And we wanted to, we wanted to just um, present this idea that we live in a city, but this city that wasn't a city before is a place of chiefs, so. Uh, normalizing, normalizing. So I'm gonna start getting, start just briefly talk about how I think we can benefit from from um, IP control. Uh, normalizing conversations. So presenting stories that build confidence in our own journey, uh, create self discovery, um, shapes personal mindset and swells pride for Aina ancestors and responsibility. And the intent on building velocity to slant narratives or create creases in the previous notion of in, of information or, or techniques are slow to reach our shores. Like I mentioned earlier, I would buy magazines, I would dig as much as I could to get a, a morsel, I would buy albums from Tower Records and read every single liner note in it because I wanted to know what, who, that, who produced that album, where it was produced, who, was, who, who were they shouting out? Like all of that information was very ono to me. Um, but it took so long for me to retain that information. Nowadays, it's a level play field. We can get information as easily as someone in LA or New York outside of people coming to your door. But a lot of people come to Hawaii. So, you know, we get a lot of visitors and uh, we, we, we get downloads here and there. So um, basically the constant pr pursuit of trying to build Hawaiian excellence. Like there's so many good things that our, our contemporaries are doing in many different spaces. Um, there's so much goodness and uh, it's not just one avenue of, you know, architecture or design or clothing or, or communications or author or being an author or food preparation, all the, it's, it's everyone. And it, it's sort of, you know, setting, setting this bar or trying to reach this bar of point excellence that I, 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 I think is very important so that we can continue the conversation. So, so we can leave this place better, you know, and Kari will come and, smash it and, 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 and create more narrative for the future. Um, how we do it is we start with the, with the Haumana, we start with the kids. Um, I am fortunate, the, I'm fortunate enough to have a relationship with, with um, Kekula Kaipuni Oanui Nui. My daughter goes there, Baba is a good friend of mine. Um, I do a mentorship program there where I can help the kids sort of understand what design is, um, help them unlock an idea and then create um, create messages that we can put on product. Um, I take them through concept all the way through to, to uh, marketing and sales. Um, it's very fruitful, but I feel like if we get this, if we take the opportunity to, to, to share with, with, with this generation, this next generation, um, how if you apply yourself and you think um, and, you start to, and you start to understand context, you can build and create you know, content for all types of scenarios. Uh, okay. Um, this is something very important to me. So we plus us plus them equals we're all the same. And it's simply like, like if I'm successful, then, you know, my employee is successful. If my employee is successful, then their kids are successful. If their kids are successful, Lahui is successful. So it's sort of this circle of success and in my little bubble and my, you know, 20 or so odd people that we, we care for and, and, and we break bread with, um, I feel extreme responsibility that we continue this, this thing. We keep feeding coal to the fire so that these people can build, you know, build their families, you know, continue their education, graduate from college, move on to, the, to their next, to, to me, that's success. That's success. That's how we're able to, um, you know, build or participate in this economy is through, through design work. And, you know, all of these, these lovely people in this photo have been, 
um, have come through the Institute of Fitted and they've all gone on, either they're still with us or they've gone on to create a life for themselves, which I'm very proud of. Um, so um, SHIP is sort of an acronym that we, we talk, talk about in our art department, supporting Hawaiian intellectual property. Um, it's a nod to ancestral innovation of sea travel, SHIP as in Va'a or also, you know, SHIP as the ex exporting of intellectual property. Tourism and military are the core economic and political drivers of society in these islands, but we recognize it as inefficient. Um, it's, it's just as finite as land. Um, that resource, you know, at some point may dry up, but our greatest, but our greatest resource isn't tied to the colonial definition of land or land management or land trade or anything of that land source, um, but rather the intellectual, the intelligence and framework um, left by our ancestors. So to me, as you know, as someone who grew up, um, uh, how I grew up and the things that I seen, being able to just be in this position and leveraging my, my you know, my, my ancestors, what that my ancestors left me, um, and be, constantly being inspired by that, the framework that they built, the ideas and concepts and, and, and execution, um, the levels of thinking. I mean, that stuff is so, I'm so blessed. I'm so thankful. I'm so proud you know, to be Hawaiian, to, to, to be able to be in this space, to be able to create, to be able to share um, that, that as, you, as Kamala was saying, you know, this part of, this part of the timeline, this Pico um, is um, incredibly, um, um, I feel, I, I feel, I feel honored to, to be in this space and be able to, to be able to do what we do. I'm so thankful. Um, so this is sort of like how we can not just think in terms of like monetary. So during the pandemic, I have some friends who are who are chefs and they had an idea. We had an idea. So we partnered. Um, so we built uh, we built this little thing called Ilili Cash and Carry, uh, which is a corner store um, serving serving pizzas and beer. And um, uh, you can pick up pasta, dry noodles. It's a little corner market. Um, it's a grabbing goal. But the IP in this space um, is informed by that space. The karst um, or the underground tunnels, the water, um, the, the basalt quarry, um, the space that was there before, the people that were there before, um, all of these things, um, pu'ukakea, sugarloaf, as they call it, and the rocks that were, that were flown down and, and created and, and created mo'ili'ili. All of these things inform space and um, with this, we're able to, it's not a barter, but we're able to leverage design and, and effort and time to ownership. Um, this was a very fun, interesting project. So we are, we are, uh, we are percentage owners of this space. Um, we take care of all of the communications, design, uh, merchandise, um, and they cook and sell uh, the product. It's a great, it's a great fun concept and case study of how we can how we can further build wealth for our team, for our community, and the people who they support. Uh, again, this was this is our office, and unfortunately, we just moved out. Of, we just moved out of it last week. But um, this just kind of goes to the idea that design, build, and spatial communications can also hold um, um, a lot of mo'olelo, uh, um, a lot of ike. So the space can be very. Few, this space, I believe we were there for 10, 11 years. Um, um, and it lasted time. I mean, it was still, it still looked like this when we left, but it's very modern. Um, it suited our needs. It was an art department, shipping, receiving, um, conference room, library. Um, uh, we had a sample department. We had a, we had jujitsu studio. We had, uh, we, a lot of fun was in there, but Halini Uhi provided us life for the past 10 years. Um, and we presented it in a way that was very modern and slick and innovative. And we love to go into work every day um, and just creating this space because it was light, airy, breezy. And we got to communicate sort of some of our principles and ideology through, through some of the, the trims and, and, and um, uh, materials that we used. Uh, strategies and solutions. So these are just like thoughts and ideas that I, that I have. Um, Registering for individual or seasonal copyrights, publishing as much work as possible, just get it out there, like just work, whatever work you can do, whether it's digital, 
whether it's for publishing print work, whether it's a, a flyer for a friend, an album cover, whatever it is, the more work that we can produce and get out there uh, that can occupy space as Hawaiian, as Kanaka ideas, the better. Um, focus conversations around IP control and council creation. Uh, blockch blockchain technology provides a unique opportunity to secure ideas, art and design in perpetuity. Um, art valuation education, supporting markets and museums that value and push art and, and design in different directions and realms. We need to open up market spaces so, so the kids growing up nowadays um, want to buy art, want to interact with art, are inspired by art. Um, we need the people and infrastructure for these things to, for these things to occur. Um, again, just publishing stuff. This is a series of posters that I'm doing. It gets just random stuff in my mind that, you know, I want to be, I started by wanting to, um, just wanting to, uh, extract different battles on this island or Ahu centric stuff. So, um, this is sort of like my own personal study on design and art. No reason at all, but I wanted to get these ideas out, see if I can illuminate it. Um, again, we just publishing, did a, we did a show, um, we did print, we did, uh, art installation, um, motion graphics and or oration, um, which was the, the, the battle of a Pokehau. So it was fun, interesting thing. Again, it was just a study um, in the social and uh, and uh, the social impact from the Battle of Apokyao, um, how Kahahana um, and and Kaikili and that and and how it affected um, effectively ended the Oahu Oahu line. Um, anyways, the, the, these are all things that interest me, and and, and it, it was it was just a way to to further and push the conversation and present something modern and and interesting. Um, this was our first, uh, NFT. It was a free po app that we gave for all of our discord community. Um, so this thing, it's not, it's not moving, but what we gave them is a, is a GIF and it rotates. Um, so each of those lines represents, um, a year of our, a year of that we've been here. And I think it was 15 lines. Um, so it rotates in each direction, but if you're a discord, a member of our discord, uh, we opened it up to for free education and to talk about cryptocurrency, to talk about NFTs, to talk about um, how we can all uh, benefit or learn at the same time. Um, so sort of just using technology and try to figure out how we can get artwork uh, pushed in different in different areas. Um, more collaboration, more design um, opportunities with friends. I think that this is one of the most important aspects that we can do as Kanaka is to work with other Kanaka um, and lift them up, um, create our own heroes. You know, Jamie and the team at Calipico is, uh, they're, 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 I mean, I love them. They're our dear friends of mine. Um, I had the opportunity to fly to Molokai and we sat down and, and, and we just opened conversation about PEVA um, and how do we mend, how do we, how do we even have opportunities to speak on things that we have conflict with? Um, how do we resolve them? Uh, and we created this thing, Hawaiian Made Projects. Uh, it was, it was. I mean, it's ongoing. You know, whenever we have an idea, we get together and and we try to figure out if there's more ways. But we 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 hand cut these screens. We printed everything. We I, we I went up there. We sold samples. It was fun. I mean, and again, just for a way for us to get together, collaborate, and to push the idea of Hawaiian excellence. How can we do more of it? Hi, hola. I go in. It's super awesome, but you you you're giving us such a seminar. We gotta jump into. Kari. Okay. No, no, but I, I just I think I'm almost sure, done. Yeah, mahalo, brother. I want to make sure that we just we're noting that you know what is really critical. What you're sharing that I don't want to lose. That you're providing so much more now. So I want to make sure that we can capture this too in the question and answer part, brother. But okay. Mahalo, I'll rip, I'll rip through the rest of the part, sorry. Uh, strategies and solutions continuing. So representation in early conversations, opportunity to share new ideas that are based in cultural consideration, leadership to synchronize talent and access to create a platform of new infrastructure, community media and corporate support will help raise all, or raise all boats. Um, it's time that we create our own and support our own heroes. 
Um, I didn't turn uh, coin the term, but you know, pr promote Aina Kanaka art and design and film as a solution to monetize um, making Ike Hawaii non-negotiable cog in any system. Yep. Um, this is how we do it. This is my hero. This is Kumu Justin. Um, he he teaches the Keiki and Ku and the Kumu at, at Kikula Kayapuni. Um, self-defense classes. These are the type of projects that I want to be more a part of. And I think this is how we can push, you know, um, Hawaiian ideas, corporate advocacy. Um, same thing Kua was saying, working with Hawaiian Airlines, PV, uh, Pacific Voyaging Society, Kamehameha Schools. Um, and then the last thing is just, um, we can all resolve uh, by strengthening our Ohana and everything you talk, uh, Pico E, Pico O, Pico O is all in this photo. It's one of my favorite photos. Um, we have ancestors, we have present, and we have the future. Thank you guys so much for your guys' time. Mahalo, Ola. But I'm super glad that they didn't film that because I was on a whole seminar, but that was the thought and attention that you put into detail and we couldn't fit into the 20 minutes we asked you to. But brother, you really, the aloha that you put into that was really powerful. And I think, you know, you, you began to answer some of the questions that were put in the chat too. So mahalo kialo. Um, Kari, can you bring us to the to the future? Yeah. Um, aloha, I'm Kari. Um, we don't have that much time left, so I'm gonna try to go through so we can get to Q and A really quickly. So I will start. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Okay, cool. So aloha again. I'm Kari Kehalani Noyo. I go Kehal as well. I'm from Koi, Hawaii. I'm a PhD student and a graduate research assistant at the Laboratory of Advanced Visualization Applications, or LAVA, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I'm also the co lead of the Emerging Media Lab called CreateX uh, with Dr. Jason Lee at the University of Hawaii at West Oahu. So, my background is actually in computer science and animation with a focus on immersive realities, human computer interaction, and game development. So what I do is uh, a bit different from uh, Keolo and Kuhao. So most of my work has to do with creating um, immersive reality applications that usually have to do with um, informal learning. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let me just loop these videos. So as I said, um, a lot of my work deals or, or is around this question because I'm in an academic field, so I'm constantly just trying to answer questions, is how do I create a multi-sensory immersive experience to tell a story that allows the user to learn through their own experience, investigation, and reflection? So um, basically what that means is that when I'm creating these sorts of projects, I'm thinking through how do I utilize all the technology that's available to us to create an environment in which through the experience, so of someone being able to interface with their, th that environment, they are able to gain a new level of understanding of a topic based on like what happened to them during that in experience and through their own interaction with that experience, what did they, what, what did they uh, discover through it? So two things, you uh, videos that are looping on the left are two of the projects that I've been working on CreateX. The lower one is mostly for fun I, I made 3D models and I wanted to feel like what it, or I wanted to uh, kind of imagine what a, a deep underwater uh, scene would look like. But above is what I actually worked on my master's thesis on called Valkyrie. And that one, it's a little bit hard to see the table, but essentially you use a touch screen and you use sort of a, a, a visual programming interface. So you drag and drop these nodes and connect them together to program this little character. The catch is that the, the nodes are actually Hawaiian phrases. So you're essentially uh, programming or you're essentially writing Hawaiian sentences to create these little characters. In this case, it was an EEV that was flying um, to populate the forest around you. So in, for this particular project, I wanted to uh, think through, or I, I based it around the idea of the more you use uh, uh, Hawaii, the more diverse and uh, abundance the force becomes so but also it, it it also is a tool to help teach basic programming logic because you know programming languages are just a language so even in Hawaiian there are rules and such that you can uh, 
that you can basically use in a visual programming language scheme to teach sort of the, uh, those kinds of concepts. So usually to summarize how my job usually goes is that it's a very collaborative effort. There is uh, usually other people who collect or create data IP or story elements. So these are scientists who collect data. These are community members who have stories to tell. And then my part comes in in the design and implementation. I take these elements uh, and try to figure out how I can showcase all of the all of the information, all the knowledge that they have in these immersive environments so that others can visit this environment and kind of, again, improve their level of understanding of whatever is in this environment. So as I said, my job is basically thinking of what are the right questions to ask and how to answer these questions. So just in the design and implementation phase, I think of first and foremost, what are the visual or also like sound, interactive, haptic, so like touch, movement and verbal capabilities of the experience. Because with technology, a computer can listen to what you have to say. A computer can uh, create haptic feedback. So this is like, you know, if you ever played a video game and it, the controller buzzes at you, those are haptics. You can create and augment the space uh, in different senses to recreate something or to bring focus to something. I also uh, have to think about like, what is the goal of the experience, right? Uh, there's a lot of potential when you create these immersive experiences to uh, create, It's I mean, it's like watching a movie. You, you can uh, direct how kind of like the emotional highs and lows of the experience and how basically you can present what you want the user to experience or the person visiting to experience. And then from there, your hope is that through that experience, they learn or, or learn something from it. And the amount of questions I tend to go through when I, when I approach a design is so long. This is why I say the list goes on. And in fact, when I wrote my master's thesis, I skipped it. When I wrote my master's thesis, it was all about trying to create a framework for what are what are the right questions to ask so you can create equitable uh, immersive experiences that utilize cultural heritage. When I wrote this though, I, I took it from the context of like, oh, someone who, anyone uh, with any background who is approaching like cultural heritage, this is kind of what they have to think about. It can be a little bit different when say for me, if I do, uh, if I'm doing stuff about uh, Hawaiian cultural heritage, it's a, it, there's a little bit of difference because I'm actually connected to the community and everything. And this, my thesis, I, it was basically like if you were starting from ground zero. But even though I am Hawaiian, there are still considerations to have, right? Because it even, so say for instance, to explain this graph really quickly, the requirements design prototype and testing is basically the basic loop of um, programming. Uh, something and then each of these waypoints are things that I I developed to say at this at this point in the development cycle stop at this waypoint and think about these certain things so at the requirement stage where you're collecting and you're working you're, you're you're newly working with your new team you guys are starting to come up with the initial ideas think about the pos positionality so positionality in this case for instance me is that yes I am native Hawaiian but at the same time I'm an ac academic. And what that kind of changes is that typically people believe academics, whatever we publish, there is the sense of that what we publish is what is backed by an institution. It's backed by research. Thus, people might believe what I have to say more over a community member, even though that's not correct at all, right? I there um, people in the community are not like lower than academics, but in the sense, I have to be conscious of that's my positionality, that I have to do my due diligence to do the extra work to make sure that I'm not like perpetuating something bad or perpetuating uh, fallacies or anything like that. So this is kind of what my process is, is stopping at every point and thinking through how is this a work actually benefiting my community? Because I think that when you're designing stuff, and especially in this context, that's the most important part, especially when you're designing something that's intent to teach. So our question of the night is the, what makes creations and innovations uh, Maoli or indigenous? I can translate, but usually when that's asked of me, it's like, how can things 
created through emerging technologies female only. And now I don't want to say like into the conversation of, oh, it has to be a Hawaiian technology for it to be like a Hawaiian innovation. That's not what we're uh, talking about here, but more so it's more so what we've already heard from Kuhao and Keoloa, uh, Keola, sorry, Keola, where it's really like what what is the foundation of it? Where, where's the source coming from? So in my next slide, I did have a simple and a complex answer. The simple answer is an indigenous person used technology to create something. So it's an indigenous creation or innovation, but that's not quite right, right? But I still think that's an answer because I think every indigenous person has the right to interpret and express and practice their heritage in whatever way they see fit because it's the, it's theirs. And it no matter what expression or what kind of medium they choose, it does not make them less Hawaiian or not Hawaiian. I only bring this up because this is actually something I see with a lot of students where they think, oh, I didn't learn X, Y, and Z cultural things by the time I was 10, thus I shouldn't touch Hawaiian culture because I'm not, I, I, I missed my opportunity, right? That shouldn't be what, what it is. But when for our conversation, what we're thinking of is, especially for in my case, where I'm an actor, where again, academic background, I have to have that level of like, people are gonna believe, people are gonna look to and reference my work as something as a foundation, might be a foundational piece in the future, is what is the creations or innovations genealogy? So I skipped it again, sorry. So I was gonna give an example of Hula, but I won't go into that because Kuha already kind of explained it as well. But the main thing is that drawing from one's own ancestral knowledge is what leads to creations and innovations that are indigenous uh, because of that genealogy of what it is. So my example was going to be the things that I create in these systems and these applications I create are not Hawaiian because I put like, like I could have made something where like I, I made a 3D model of a hula dancer who she's doing hula that doesn't make it Hawaiian but what actually can make it more and what we can define as a Hawaiian innovation is like the questioning and the thought process behind like if I were to say what does hula teach me about visualization and augmentation that can be transferred to emerging technologies right it's not just the the, the knowledge in there can't just be adornments it's actually the the thought and it's uh, Keola and Kuhao already went through exactly and you saw how they thought about these things more deeper than oh you know everyone loves the triangle yeah <laughs> everyone says that and immediately thinks Hawaiian so you know if I put that on a shirt and I sell it everyone's going to be like oh I feel Hawaiian that's not what it is it's the actual deeper thought and meaning that goes into the design of everything that we do so even though that our what our outcomes are, what our products are, whether it's clothes, whether it's um, graphic design, whether it's immersive uh, experiences and realities, the thought process or like there's a core technique where it is really is just looking back at our ancestral knowledge and bringing that and thinking deeply about it to guide our designs of whatever we create. And then I'm going to go shortly over because I know we're getting close to the end, is that also it's important to remember that there's responsibilities when it comes to uh, utilizing one's ancestral knowledge. It's kind of what Kuhal says, like who owns the Hawaiian Triangle? It's all of us. It's remember that your ancestral knowledge is supposed to be for the community, not just you, even though it's your ancestral knowledge, right? It's the knowledge that our ancestors cultivated and perpetuated all the way down time until it finally was passed on to you. So I think that if a pro any project that claims to be like an indigenous or Hawaiian innovation, you have to look to, are they also trying to cultivate, protect and perpetuate that knowledge somehow to pass down to the next generation or even just their own generation? Because again, I still want to, I still bring up that there's never too late to learn about your own culture or it's never too late to say like, oh, I'm not Hawaiian enough because I didn't learn X, Y, and Z when I was in elementary school or whatever. So to sum it up for really quickly for the for, uh, my particular industry, I think that for the work that I do, it's not just about being tech savvy, it's being able to understand what and to 
think of the questions that need to be asked to be able to think through these deeper processes when figuring out how to how to design these tools. So overall, I chose computer science and I, I, I went down the path that I did was because at first, like the first thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to create systems that provided accessibility to knowledge to people who may not otherwise be able to access it or also just don't learn through the typical ways that we learn in school and such. But the tech industry is vast and there are many other ways to utilize art and programming. So I think that developing an expertise in tech skills as well as the understanding of how to connect our ancestral knowledge or all the things that, all the good things that were passed down to us into our, our core where we draw from, draw from to design what we design uh, is a way that we will go and be able to create technologies that are more equitable and sustainable for our communities. And I'll end there. Mahalo. Well, mahalo Kako. Um, it was an honor to listen to the three of you. Um, you know, and you know, o, what we will continue to learn is that the, the passing on of traditions and responsibilities is is super vital and that it needs to be something that lives and things that live get fed and feed. Um, you know, Ola, you, you legitimately gave us a seminar and I've, you know, trying to do Maoli things in constructs of Western time and, and Zoom and Windows, you know, we always, there's never enough time to share the knowledge and the knowledge that you share is hard earned through years of practice and you really graced us with just expressing all of that in that window of time. And like, there's so many bombs in what you shared was just like seminar. Um, and of course, we're all Kari's opening act, right? And I think Kari, like the future is what he named, meaning that we need to move towards spaces that is not just dominated by the most physically violent, but it becomes the spaces that the people who may be the most brilliant, but they don't have the space to talk as you lift up, are, are allowed to speak and we hold space for you. So what you shared about, you know, the entry point and what it means to be a Hawaiian thing and the work that you're doing to build this out, you know, I feel a lot more confident in the future. So I really want to mahalo you for all the time you took to share with us today. Um, we got questions. I want us to read the question from the audience first just so that we can acknowledge them. And I think it's helpful for us. And I think this is a question that maybe Kari touched upon, but um, any manao on what you and researchers have in common? Kako. Oh, I yeah, see you laughing, so everyone asks you, because I know all of you spend all your time researching everything, and like, there's formal and there's informal research, but maybe that's a really good place to start. No, no, I, I, I was laughing because, um, you know, I, I'm not the most academically ta talented at all whatsoever, and so maybe a, maybe a late bloomer of sorts, but I would definitely say that I think um, uh, beyond just, you know, elementary and high school, I think what I've come to learn is that my favorite part about projects is the research and getting into that iteration of finding the right answers or finding this spread of answers to be able to communicate properly through design or communicate properly through architecture or whatever the medium is going to be. And so I think that um, uh, the process is very similar and that research is definitely a key component of it. And I think that that's what is the most, um, that's the commonality between the two. And so that's why even more so when I run into um, academics that are really good at research, I even more nerd out because they, you know, they've been doing this as a career for so long. So I think that it's not necessarily just the similarities, but how can the two be and how can the two work together? Mahalo. Hola, any manao? Um, I mean, as far as research, I mean, everything starts there, you know, you can only be as good as um, your references and, you know, having good support system with Kumu and, 
and and stuff but also sometimes they dive in and it's hard to get out <laughs> like there's so much good stuff you know these rabbit you're going down these rabbit holes and i mean I could, you could spend 30 40 hours in a rabbit hole and come out just as confused as before you started you know so, <laughs> um it's an integral part of the process uh i i love it i'm a i'm a sponge it's my favorite part for sure awesome Kari, anything you want to add to that? And it. Uh, no, I don't. I just think, like designers are researchers, right? And especially like, as you, as we've seen through everyone's presentations, no one just like no one just thoughtfully just puts a flower anywhere, right? When you do, especially when you do art, you don't always just do something just because you do it. Some, sometimes you do, but a lot of the times it's more well thought out than that. So I don't see it as any different from academic research. The only difference is that when you're in academics, you have to do a bunch of paperwork and such, but like the practice is there, yeah? So I think it's mostly the same. Uh, we have a question from Antti Deviana McGregor, who's on the call today. And she, how do we challenge appropriation of our cultural images. Um, I think I think Ola actually has a pretty good answer to this uh, that he kind of went over to. First of all, hi, Auntie Diviana. I hope you're doing well. Um, I would say personally, uh, and this is just this is just from. Um, me being stuck in a retail store. I think if your retail store has your prices on it, then people are more willing to pay it. And so I think that as we look at each of these cultural appropriations, I think maybe we got to look at the systems of reciprocity first. And how do we bring the reciprocity towards environment, reciprocity towards community, reciprocity towards practice? And then from there, how do we build that into a financial model or into uh, economic model that can benefit that. So for me, you know, everybody coming here and being inspired, they don't see any prices, so they just feel free to use it. And I think that what Olo was talking about normalizing conversations is um, probably the best start. And then I would probably just hand this over to Ola because he was talking about blockchain, which is probably the next step to that. Yeah. I, that's a whole, I didn't want to go too far in, into blockchain, but it, it essentially it gives us an opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to stamp, timestamp an idea, uh, a thought. Um, I mean, and you talked about it, you know, with, with the triangle, it's a perfect example. You know, like, like I think, you know, the Kumulipo is in perpetuity for all of us, like should never be used you know, for any type of monetary gain, locking it on the blockchain so nobody could ever do that, could ever use it. Um, I mean, just like things like that, just the, the, the possibilities of it is, 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 is very, very interesting. Um, again, I'm, you know, I, normalizing the conversation, sure, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but also, you know, I think that if, if we as Hawaiians continue to produce artwork and, and narrative and, and content, we take back, we take up, we take back that space. That's our space. And that's where we, I sort of navigate and I want to do more of it. Um, and it's not their fault that, you know, the brands in Italy, they don't know, you know, they've been here once or twice and have been inspired. It's amazing that they're inspired enough to spend all this money to create, uh, you know, their whole brand based off of a, you know, a Kanaka idea. But it's, we need to get us into that space. So we need, you know, we did, needed the support and advocacy of corporate Hawaii and, and, and beyond and media. And we need to, you know, support and create our own heroes and, you know, we need to take that space back because it's ours. Kari, I think you have a really unique perspective on this too because of the spaces you work, you know, and what, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so I think it's a very difficult question because uh, I don't think you can, like, okay, let's say you can't really stop people from appropriating because they don't know, it's going to be they don't know better or they're just that kind of people, yeah. And so I think what it is, is, 
you know, there are, there are different tools out there. I have to say, I'm not actually confident in the blockchain for perpetuating those kinds of things just because of how it's done. But in other senses, I think what the core of the thought behind it is important is that what is more, what, what's going to, you can't stop cultural appropriation, but what helps it is that if people know and are knowledgeable and like you educate them on how to know like when something is legit or like how to showcase the genealogies that connects it back right because if for something that's appropriated they're going to have nothing they just pulled it out of air they pulled it because they saw your shirt in the window kind of deal <laughs> right so i think having that and being able to also just create create an environment where there is a lot of more of actual things of like not appropriated right so because if everyone just sees appropriated things they're going to think that's what's right if we actually produce more whatever it is whether it is through a product whether it is through experiences whether it is through entertainment so on and so forth um then that's going to make it so that it's easier for people to recognize when people are just pulling something out of their butt <laughs> essentially <laughs> Mahalo, Kari. And I I also love the fact that Ola's approach to it, when Jay-Z appropriated Hawaiian, Sophie, he appropriated it right back, right? So I think that's the part is that, um, I don't know, maybe it's just the why and I mean, to people take our shit, we can go back and take it from them and build the capacity to do that. And I think that is something where the economic sovereignty piece comes in, right? I, it, it is a real issue in the Powell Clinic Declaration. It's been running rampant and there is no silver bullet or easy answer to it but I love that you know there's gonna it's a moving target of a conversation and I think people take from people that they feel have no agency then when you develop this agency we bite back <laughs> then, then it's likely to take from here but then it's also a welcoming into the space of like asking why you feel empowered to appropriate stuff in the first place like, what is it about you and your own lack of culture and your lack of thing that you feel to borrow from someone else? Yeah? And the, the entitlement that allows people to borrow in the first, like, to take stuff without asking in the first place, I hear that this is a broadening of, like, our presence in global spaces to the excellence of our work that will allow that to happen. You know, we're, we're closing in on the last um, couple minutes. We have some questions, too, but maybe we can send them via email i don't think we can answer questions in three minutes between all of us and do it well but i do super want to mahalo the three of you for being present today um you've shared your manao and as creatives you've shared part of yourself you've shared your journey you shared your genealogy willingly to people who are listening today and i don't want to undervalue that and i really want to thank and that thank you for your willingness to pull part of who you are out and share it in public. I want to mahalo Rosie, Katie, and Sara um, here for creating this space, um, for creating this opportunity. Maybe we can show um, really quickly before we formally close, if you can just show the slides of what's coming next, um, just to kind of wrap up. Um, so if you enjoyed this, and I know you did because this is super exciting. Um, the final presentation where we get um, knowledge and stewardship practices, what are platforms and approaches to safeguard our knowledge and data relationships on May 26. I think Auntie Davy is going to be the kahu of that space. Um, sorry, what did I say? Day, sorry, May 24th, date correction. So we, we have to correct the date on that, but it's going to be on May 24th. And of course, we all owe so much to Auntie Davy and the work that she's been doing on all of our behalf as one of our, like our kumu in the space to allow us to be comfortable in our skins as Hawaiians and to talk about these things freely and the sacrifices her and Rwanda have made on our behalf. So really make sure to show up for this. Um, but just to close it all down, I just wanna continue to send aloha to all of our speakers and all of you who are listening just mahalo for being here after work, five o'clock on Friday. If you're watching this later on YouTube, shaka, that's awesome that you're learning about this. And make sure that if you see Ola's work, you see Kuhao's work, you see Kari's work, any place support them because they're helping us lead the way forward and 
not just being subject to what other people think about us, but presenting ourselves globally and standing in our own, comfortable in our own skin as Kanaka. But like, like Kalaka, what they like, yeah, we Kanaka, we're going to bring back hula and electricity at the same time. And you can tell us we're savages. No, we're going to stand comfortable in our, in our skin and use your technologies in ways that we see fit. But we're going to be beholden to this at the end of the day. Is, is our land healthy? And are people thriving? And at the end of the day, that's what it means to be Kanaka that we can live in this space and create productivity and bequeath to the next generation the same, even a better opportunity to do it. So it's an honor to be amongst all of you today. Mahalo for letting me kahu this space. And it is now 6.30. I want to close it with aloha. Ahui ho. Aamama uanoa.